Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and today we're still in Lawrence, Kansas. This is home to the Reuter Organ Company, where they've been building organs since 1919. Uh, we're going to take a look around today. We'll be here all day. Uh, so uh, I hope you'll watch this and enjoy seeing how they build pipe organs and meeting some of the people that make these instruments possible. So this is J.R. Nutel, president of the Reuter Organ Company. J.R., thanks for letting us come in today and welcome. look around your Good shop. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Um, Reuter has been in business now for 102 years. 102 years. Um, all, almost all of that in Lawrence here. Um, we talked about their Opus 1. There's a video about that that we can uh, click up there and see where they actually built it in Illinois right. and then it wasn't finished because of a tornado. And right. Opus 1, no, Opus one and 2, same, same order. Same, okay, so yeah. uh, that, that one finally made it in, uh, from here in Lawrence where you've been there since 1917 um, and this is a, a new building as far as Oregon comes yeah, new building um, we made the decision back in about 1999 uh, committed to the building spent a year and a half two years in the design phase and uh, construction began in, in uh, the spring of 2000 and uh, we had a ribbon cutting, cutting in June of 2001. Okay, so you've been here for almost 20 years. 20 years, getting close. Yes, yeah. um, what's it like to design an organ shop from the ground up? Because most of them I've seen, are they started as different things or right. evolved. Uh, it was, it's uh, a lot of thought went into it. My, my father handled most of that stuff while I was busy doing organ stuff and building organs and, and taking care of the shop. And he, he did the, the design work for all of this. Um, he visited a lot of different organ companies mm -hmm. to get an idea of their flow and the feel of now and how things worked. And then we sat down, we came up with an initial plan and then took it to an architect and he kind of laughed and <laughs> said, you can't afford that. <laughs> so we sat down and began a collaboration with architects and builders and ended up with what we have today. Mm -hmm. so. Very good. And your father was the previous president. Yes. You grew up in this place. Um, right. Yeah, many years. I'm on my 40th year with Reuter. Right, so yeah. you've been you've been building organs pretty much your whole life. Right, and yeah. growing up, so Started with my dad. You know more about this place than anything else. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, I, I'm excited to see the shop, so we're going to take some cameras out and go meet some of the staff. Wonderful. And hear some of the instruments that we have uh, set up, and uh, hopefully our viewers will enjoy a trip here to Lawrence and, and learn more about the Reuter Organ Company. Uh, we hope so also. Adam Singleton, um, what's your job here at Roy Dory? So I work in the voicing department and I work on the flutes. Okay. Um, and he's going to kind of be pulling us around through the shop today. Uh, tell us about the room we're in right now. So this is the engineering department. So the genesis of every organ has begun here. And every organ from the Opus 1 up until present day, every archive and correspondence for every instrument is located in all these drawers and files and so forth. Yeah, um, I, I see we've got files all over the room. Mm -hmm. It's a, quite a, a collection of history here just mm -hmm. in this space. So it must be handy to have access to all those old oh, yeah. uh, files and documents, whatever necessary. So, um, well, good. Well, we'd like to see how organs are designed. Um, and uh, John's going to show us through uh, how he does this. John Deal. And what's your job here? Um, I'm engineering and design. So I pretty much take everything that comes out of the office and turn it into something that the shop can build. So what do you get from the office? How much information do you usually have? I get something like this, mm -hmm. which has and spells out a lot of its kind of legal mm -hmm. and doesn't apply to me because it talks about, you know, what the purchaser is expecting and what they're expected to provide for right, us right. and all that stuff. But then I get this part, which is the general specification, okay. which should have a complete list of basically every single knob that's going to be on the console mm -hmm. and what it plays. Okay. And so As in what kind, how many pipes are going to be, if it's a borrowed exactly. stock or, or something. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then 
I'll go through, and I've got all kinds of scribbles on this one, talking about you know what the wind pressure is, um, whether it's a pitman or a unit stop, all kinds of things like that. Sure. And then the back end of it will have a lot more specific information, you know, like about a lot of what we're doing right now is refurbishing old organs, mm -hmm. so this will have information exactly how in depth we're getting with that. I see. You know, are we keeping the old console? Are we completely rebuilding the old console? Are we just kind of reworking the old console and moving on? Gotcha. Things like that. And then this one has the added benefit of having a picture of the rendering, kind of what it's supposed to look like. Oh, so they already have an idea of what they're mm -hmm. finishing. Uh, by the time I get this, the, um, the visual design has pretty much been completed. I see. So you're mainly worried about the internal design and the engineering of right. the playing parts of the organ. And then also how to make this actually work. <laughs> so what do you start with when, you, when you've got the design, you've got the stop list, you've got your renderings, where do you, what's your first step? So if it's an old organ, and particularly if it's a Reuter, it's a lot easier. I start with the old file. Mm. Because most of these old files have the old engineering folder because it's got all the old chest bills. Oh. So I can go in and take all of this information and enter it onto the computer and I don't have to go measure a darn thing. <laughs> so it speeds it up a lot. Um, but for instance, we're also working on a project for an Episcopal, the Episcopal Cathedral in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That's an old molar, so we don't have any of the drawings on that. So a lot of how it starts is me getting the old chests and figuring out what size they are, where, where the ranks are going to go. Mm -hmm. And that's start with the room size, start with the givens, you know, what the internals that, I'm, that I have to use, and then we go from there. So mm -hmm. this will actually kind of give you a pretty good idea of how I start. So these blue lines here, these are the room dimensions. I'm stuck with that. Okay. I can't change it. Nothing's ever going to change with that. This particular part of it, I have the benefit of we're doing all new chess. Mm, so, you can. so I kind of get to play Tetris a little <laughs> bit more with that than I do with some of the other things. But, you know, I there are certain constraints that I'm working with. I can't make the action any smaller than mm -hmm. the action's going to be, regardless of the pipe size. So I get something like this that says, okay, we need X number of pipes. And basically what I'm told is X number of pipes, this size space, figure it out. <laughs> and for the most part, again, you have to get inventive. So for instance, on one of the chambers, I've got one to 12 of the old wood principle stacked on the side oh, because okay. there's no other way it would fit. Do you have any tools within this software that help you automate the process or speed up making things fit? Um, one that we use a lot um, is called Layout 8. Um, we're on version I now, <laughs> um, just as various things have changed. But for instance, with this, we've got a couple different options for chest layouts, whether it's going to be what we call our 8-foot, 61-note chromatic pitman or diatonic, you know, whether it goes like this or whether it goes like this or this. Um, and I can just plug in the scale and I copy all of these columns into AutoCAD and That's I hard. have pipes. So now that you've got all this laid out and designed, what happens next? Then I have to uh, put together uh, bills. This is an example of a sheet that chest department will get. This is a new chest that we built for this organ. You got side views, front views, and then particularly treble end views. Um, and that just tells them the exact dimensions of what they're working with. And then they'll also get a layout, which is a full-size sheet of paper that comes out of that thing. And from that, they'll get all the hole centers, and that's how they build the chest. They actually use the paper to mark where the, mm -hmm. the pipe holes are going to be. Exactly. All right. The other thing that I have to generate is the actual plans that will specifically go to the assembly room. So the assembly room will take all the finished pieces and assemble it into what you actually see when it gets to your church. Because they put it together exactly as mm -hmm. it's going to be. Where exactly. Everything's got to fit and here. And if it doesn't, they come and yell at me yeah. because I screwed something up for them. <laughs> <laughs> and so figuring out, because this is what the whole thing looks like, 
So I have to figure out how to dissect that into various pieces that will actually make sense on paper. When you actually get into the assembly room, this is the plan sheet for the big organ that is currently set up right now. So you can see starting with room plans, just kind of giving dimensions and electrical information uh, for the actual chambers. And then getting into, so this is the same sheet that you were seeing on the computer, you know, kind of taking out all that mess of lines and just you know, different views to try and explicate as many of the questions that they might have. So what is the space we're in here? The space we're in here is our mill room. Uh, all the lumber that we get in comes in in rough form. We don't buy two by fours from your <laughs> local big box store. Um, they're not straight enough, they're not clean enough, they're not pretty enough. So everything comes in oversized. We can cull through it, get rid of knots, splits, warpage, etc. So we, we've seen how the organs are designed and laid out. You get then a sheet that tells you what, how much wood you need for every Correct. part of the organ, right? Correct. We can figure out square footage of plywood. We can figure out species of lumber and we can begin the construction process, um, not just on paper, but in our mind, get our, our, our brains wrapped around the project before the lumber shows up and we can start our, our procedure. So you know even before you start if you've got enough wood and Absolutely. You need what you need to do and you Absolutely. could get to the exact cuts I, you need. I hate to get to the part way through a project and not have what I need. <laughs> well, from here then we've got all the pieces cut. How are they then sent out to the shop? Or well, the lumber, like, like I said, the lumber comes in rough, so it, it gets jointed, so it has a straight edge, a flat surface, surface, and then it's, it's planed to a nominal thickness that's required for whatever component it's making, and ripped to uh, an approximate width, usually in this room, then taken to the appropriate department and, and finished. Okay. They're sanded, shaped, whatever needs to be done. Now in addition to solid wood, I see you do stock plywood in here as well. A lot of plywood these days. Mm -hmm. A lot of plywood these days. It's very cost effective when you're doing large areas. Now when people hear plywood, they generally think the big box store stuff that you get. They and that's, do. that's not what you're working with here, is it? We, we do two basic types of plywood in our industry. The very nice, pretty veneered finish that you would see uh, for a cabinet door, or the, uh, the side of a structure. And then we also implement what's called architectural grade plywood made out of Baltic birch. And we use that because it has more layers to the plywood. It's inherently stronger and is used for structural pieces to support load bearing, etc. Very good. Well, I'd love to come see you now where everything goes all together. Oh, you bet. Let's take a tour. All right. So, but just tell me what we're looking at here in the, so we're in the, what do we call this area? This, this area we're in is called a casework department. And primarily, primarily uh, our casework department is what most people would think of as the cabinet shop. This is the exposed woodworking that you will see when you enter the church. We do the console shells. We do decorative casework up on the walls that house the facade pipes. We've been commissioned to build wooden baptisms, communion tables, pulpits, whatever uh, matching furniture the the church might want or the school might want to accompany their console. You've got a few tools out here in places, but mostly it's just an open space where you can use to set up whatever you need. A lot of the things that we build uh, require a large footprint. They really do. Probably one of the smallest being the console hmm. itself. The current casework that we're working on is about 15 feet wide and 20 some feet tall. And it's all laid down and assembled on sawhorses, pre-assembled on sawhorses, so that we know all the joints are good and, and everything's going to line up before it goes vertical. This is Ted Burgess. He's head of the pipe shop here at Reuter. Uh, you do actually make and manufacture your own pipes here from, from the smallest to the largest. We do. That's right. Tell me about the process in, in okay. making pipes. I, the smaller pipes are built out of an alloy of tin and lead, 50-50 tin and lead. Uh, and we actually get the metal in and cast it ourselves on a casting table into sheets and then uh, make the pipes from that process. Okay. Uh, larger pipes 
uh, the the alloy metal won't hold up it's too soft and it'll settle mm -hmm. over a period of time so we build the larger pipes out of uh, copper or zinc mm -hmm. generally um, we have rolls of zinc to scale that we use so that we don't have to cut the the edge of them copper we do have to cut the edge of we get it in in sheets mm -hmm. uh, with copper we weld our seams for the most part uh, which makes it much stronger. We tried soldering and found out that when we tried to round it up, the solder seams broke. Mm. Uh, so welding was a much stronger and quicker way to do it. I've noticed that, uh, especially in embroidered organs, I see a lot more copper than I do in a lot of other uh, mm -hmm. instruments for whatever reason. Is there a specific reason behind that or is that just the way things are, have, have been done around here? One of, one of the issues that we had was we started using a, a softer zinc product mm -hmm. Um, because it was hard to get United States zinc anymore. So uh, we started using a, a, a foreign zinc and it was much softer and it curved over a period of time or, or settled uh, and by doing it out of copper instead of the soft zinc we don't have that issue. So your pipes so the won't pipes lose hold, their shape. Yeah. Right, they okay. hold up much longer. So. How many people work here in this department with you? Um, we have four or five in general that work in this department. Um, just depends upon job assignments and who we need at any given time. These, these are the softer metals, the alloys that we use that are 50-50 tin and lead. Um, we get them in, in either a brick like this or an ingot like this um, and put it in our casting pot. Uh, we cast at about 470 to 480 degrees Fahrenheit, and we cast a sheet of metal, which is behind these here, um, and it's called spotted metal in the organ industry. Uh, I guess it's because the alloys don't perfectly mix, and so they're trying to separate and cool at a little bit different rate. The sheets that we cast generally weigh from 47 to 64 pounds, something like that. And once we cast them, we cast them on a slate table. The slate table is probably no longer available because the slate is very thick and I don't think you can buy slate like that anymore. Uh, and once we get a sheet cast, we put it on our thickness planer, which we designed in shop, and uh, plane it to a given thickness. And it's very accurate within about a thousandth of an inch. We cast metal when we need it and it depends upon the size of the job. I like to have six months worth of metal on the shelf at any given time because it needs to age a little bit. It's very stiff when it first comes off the uh, casting table and uh, so that gives it a time to kind of soften up a little bit so we don't get square corners when we try to round it up in the pipe making process. So after the metal's been aged and planed then what happens next? Well, then we get a specific order for a specific set of pipes and we bring that sheet in this general area and we coat it with a coating which both signifies what the, the weight of the metal is, how thick it is, and also uh, it protects it so that we can um, solder it. If you solder the metal without protecting it with this size coating, it makes a mess. It just won't solder. So you can see on this shelf there are different colors um, and I know that for instance looking at the green there is 45 thousandths sheet of metal and the brown is 40 and so on down in increments of five thousandths. Once we get the the metal painted we have for the most part patterns um, for a given uh, stop of pipes and we can use the patterns to lay out the, the any given set. The size is a mixture of chalk and gum arabic um, mixed up and, and coated. It's, it's painted on as a liquid, dries, and then we put another um, coat on individual solders, solder seams. This is a principal rank of pipes that's laid out, a four foot principal. Um, as you can see, the different colors uh, signifying the different thicknesses, which helps the pipe maker. Here are the feet down at this end and the bodies uh, above. 
A rack of pipes like this will weigh roughly 87 pounds. Wow. Uh, something like that, and we weigh everything, so of course we can keep our inventory straight. So these these are the pieces that are simply rolled around the mandrels to That's create right. the shape, soldered together, and you um, just need language and you're there. Huh? That's right. Okay. Right, and a few ears maybe. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yes. The patterns for these pipes are based on old scales and information the company's been using for a very long time. I That's assume. right. Um, so you, it's pretty much just you know, cookie cutter sort of patterns, but occasionally you do get different things Certainly. that you have to, you have to figure out and, and, and mm -hmm. measure these yourself and, and that's right. come up with the that's patterns, right. so that's amazing. Yeah. This is a card of tapered mandrels. We use these for rolling the feet on pipes. Um, we have in the shop turned the wooden ones ourselves, and then we have some metal ones, and I honestly don't know where they came from. They've been here longer than I have. Those tapered mandrels are required for the tapered feet that we put on the pipes. It looks like we have a wide variety there, but we never have enough. We always need more. We, we also have, of course, straight mandrels for um, the bodies of the pipes. They go from maybe smaller than an eighth of an inch in diameter to uh, almost 12 inches in diameter for a large 32 footer. This is the workstation that I usually work at when I'm building pipes. Uh, you can see that there are lots of tools around, lots of files. Uh, there's a lot of handwork involved in this. Uh, not too many mechanized procedures. Uh, when we roll a pipe, we roll it by hand for the most part. Uh, we use soldering irons like this. Uh, the guys who take tours call this a large soldering iron. I call this a small one. Oh, wow. um, we have much larger ones that we use for really big pipes. Uh, soldering pipes can be easy if you spend a lot of time preparing. If you don't spend much time preparing, it can be very, very difficult. You need to make sure that you get a good, solid seam, otherwise Five years down the road, the pipe might have a crack in the back seam and then it doesn't sound right. So. We have uh, some candle, basically, it's, it's um, like candle wax. And in fact, we used to use church candles, but they stopped putting the stearic acid in the, the church candles. So now we have to order a flux special that has that in it. Um, also, here's here's one that, that comes as, as a, in a yeah. candle form. Um, that is a flux and it makes the solder flow and stick. If you don't have that, it doesn't work. It, it will not stick at all. So you have to put that on the edges that you want to connect together. That's right. And the preparation for the edges of the pipe is such that we paint on the size and then we scrape it off with a tool like this and we form basically a little trough to lay, lay the bead of solder in. Then we solder and then we round it up to make sure it's nice and round. So where the pipe's coming together, it actually has a little bit of an edge yes. so that the solder can grab onto the that's, metal. That's right. And mm -hmm. that little pointed edge will help you draw that in there. Oh, that's okay. Right. Here's some solder. We use, for the most part, quarter inch solder in this area. Um, it's 6337 tin lead, uh, so it's just a little bit higher grade than the metal that we're soldering, which means this so or melts just a little bit lower temperature and uh, it's easier to use. Because of the, the melting point of the metal you're soldering and the solder itself are actually really close. They actually are so very, you can, very if it gets similar. too hot, you can actually damage the pipe and That's right. melt the metal. That's it's very easy to do that. So this, is, this is a Borden. Uh, Bordens also have caps on the top. Uh, I've already completed the caps and they're invoicing because they get felted. The cap will slide over the top of the body of the pipe. Uh, Bordens are heavy, and for that reason, these pipes are two different kinds of metal. We use the spotted metal at the top, and the, or I'm sorry, the spotted metal at the bottom, and the zinc at the top. Uh, the zinc makes it a little lighter weight, so it's not so heavy. Um, 
but you can see that we have to solder a seam before we, we join the two metals. And we do that before we roll the metal, in this case. And the zinc doesn't require the sizing, so it's only on the spotted metal. Right, the, the zinc has a different um, process to protect it. Um, the sizing won't stick to the zinc very well, so we use just the, the gum arabic that we mix in the size on the zinc and put a coating there. When we build a set of pipes that has caps, and instead of using a flat cap on the top, we like to dome them, um, and that helps us because because it's domed, it's stronger, so we can use a lighter weight material. And in using the lighter weight material, then the cap doesn't try to detune the pipe all the time because the weight wants to press down and, and make the pipe tune shorter. So we dome them for strength and for a lighter weight. And we built this jig with this press so that here's what a cap top would look like. We put it in this arbor press and then pull down like that and we have a domed cap top. So I'm going to jump in and stop the video here because in the next segment, Ted uh, put together a pipe for us and it made for a really good video. We got really great shots of it and I didn't want that to get buried here at the end of this one. Uh, so you can go over and uh, click on that and you can see this video and then I hope you'll continue with part two of the tour of the Reuter Organ Company. Thanks for watching.